Live long and prosper. So in this video series, I'm going to be talking through the social justice elements of every episode of the original series of Star Trek. Um, the thing that inspired this project was actually a Fox News article which argued that Star Trek has in some way betrayed its traditional commitment to sort of political neutrality or middle ground by embracing progressive politics. In this series, we're going to see that Star Trek has always embraced progressive politics and it's always been aspirational for social justice in various senses. Um, I am taking a broad perspective on social justice here, um, so that may, that may include multiple different types of uh, social justice, whether that's racial, whether that's economic, whether that's religious, whether that's abilities, gender and sexuality, um, anything, anything broadly considered. Um, I will go through every episode. Some of the episodes I will, I will interview fellow Trekkies and talk with them about it. Um, and then below, uh, in the descriptions, I will give you additional information about the episodes, particularly uh, their original air date, who wrote the, the, uh, the screenplay, and who uh, directed that episode. I also want to dedicate this series to my dad, Michael Allen Zapkin. Uh, he was an OG Trekkie from back in the day, and uh, it was watching the original series with him that I came to love Star Trek. Hello. So in this video, I'm joined by my friend Colin Cox, and we're going to be talking about the episode Plato's Stepchildren. Um, so first off, I do want to say this is so far at least the only uh, video in this entire series. I have not been wearing one of my Star Trek shirts. I apologize if that was a big concern for people. Um, all of my Star Trek shirts are uh, in the laundry, so I'm wearing my Reese. But that one's Trek relevant, shirt, you which, know. Yeah, it's I relevant. Mean, it seemed yeah. like the next best thing. So, but that being out of the way, Colin, thanks for joining me. Um, and I'm going to let you introduce yourself, and then we'll, sure. we'll go. Good. No, thank you, Phil. Again, this is, uh, what, I think the third time I've I've joined you as a guest. Is that right? I can't remember. Second or third? Second or third. Anyway, I'm so excited to be here. Um, thank you so much. Yeah, my name is Colin Cox. I'm an assistant professor of English at Northeast State Community College in Tennessee. I host a couple of podcasts, if you're interested. One is called the... Flutter Desk podcast. One is called the Hop Ons podcast. I I live in Tennessee. Links will be in the I, description below. Links, sure. Yeah, I live in Tennessee. Phil and I know one another because we went to grad school together in Vermont. And I may have mentioned this last time. We uh, lived within the same complex or compound, and we would uh, walk down to the diviest dive bar on occasions in Vermont and have just a great time, a lot of fun karaoke there, but I'm on Friday nights we, exclusively. We, di we didn't do karaoke. We listened to drunk That's people correct. do karaoke. Yeah. We played yeah, pool yeah, yeah. and darts in the back room. Pool and darts in the back. That is correct. Um, no, I have known Phil for quite some time. It's great to be here, but that's that's who I am. So, and again, I'm so happy to be here. This is so exciting. I love this episode. I, I never watched it before. Super excited to talk about it, though. All right. Um, do you want to give us a, a brief plot summary, and then we'll launch into the social justice discussion? <laughs> we can definitely do that. Um, yeah, and I told you I definitely wanted to offer the summary because I think this is an interesting like Warshak test. What do I remember? What don't I remember? So um, the crew of the Enterprise, right? The Enterprise, um, they receive a distress signal from the Plutonians, which I promise I'll try not to laugh every time. They are um, what an ancient civilization that uh, lived during the ancient Greece period um, but then left and formed this civilization on what they described as an uninhabited planet, which I hope you and I can talk about because I think you and I have come to an agreement that anytime someone says the planet was uninhabited, 
it probably wasn't. There was definitely a genocide that happened that they don't want to discuss. Um, but they sent this distress signal because um, Parman, the, the philosopher king, right? He sustained an injury and they need a doctor. And they meet the, really the figure who represents the slave class within this utopia, Alexander. And what Parman wants um, once he recovers is for uh, Dr. Boy, I'm sorry, it's it's McCoy. Dr. What's his last name? McCoy, right. He decides they actually need Dr. McCoy to stay. And through a series of humiliating um, torture sequences, Parman tries to convince the doctor to stay. He tortures and humiliates Kirk and Spock and then a few other members of the Enterprise. Um, Kirk, Spock, and Alexander, along with McCoy, realize through some interesting blood analysis that it's actually the native food to this planet that gives them... Oh, and they have telekinetic powers, if I didn't say so. This is how they're able to do all of this. Um, yeah. So, so um, Dr. McCoy finds a way to give Kirk and Spock those telekinetic powers. They... Uh, when the day Harmon in a rather disingenuous way says we will reform Kirk doesn't believe them. And there's some suggestion that there will be um, maybe oversight from uh, Starfleet. And then Alexander triumphantly leaves with Kirk and the crew of the enterprise. How did I do? How did I, I think I got it all. Yeah. Yeah. You got the main points. Okay. So cool. yeah. All right. Uh, so there's a lot, there's a lot here to talk about, I think. Uh, there's a lot of really fascinating stuff. Um, again, the episode is called Plato's Stepchildren. Um, this civilization, the Platonians, are theoretically rooted in the philosophy of Plato. We'll definitely talk about that, but we'll talk about... And I, you know, for me, that's kind of the most interesting question. And I think everything else that we touch on, the questions of torture, the questions of how the society runs, the questions of, you know, all of all of these things. Um, ultimately, the question I, I think that's most interesting and, and is going to underlie everything else is, is this a... Platonist society or not? Mm -hmm. Like, are they are they genuinely disciples of Plato, or have they somehow failed? Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, I think that's a question. Maybe I want to sort of hold off on mm -hmm. directly answering toward the end because I want us to go through some of these other issues mm -hmm. first. So um, you had you had brought up this idea because we we talked about this um, before. I forget which episode it was. Uh, Wasn't there an actor about? who committed a genocide or something? There was an actor who committed a genocide. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, so in Dagger I don't remember Mind. the title of the. Yeah, yeah, maybe like he he would do like he would do like what Hamlet and Macbeth and Lear maybe yes. I think uh, he was part of like a traveling actors troupe right and they. Kirk, I think Kirk, right, thought, no, he's this, uh, yeah. you know, this dude who did a genocide, you know, as people do. So, yeah. 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 Um, governor, fuck, I can't remember his character's name. Yeah, I don't. Uh, yeah. He was the governor of Tarsus IV. So. Yeah, there it is. Every, yeah, everybody yeah, yeah, yeah. knows him. Everyone uh, knows uh, that yeah. guy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so so we, we, we talked about this in that episode, this idea that, like, we should be somewhat skeptical when when people say this was an uninhabited planet or whatever it is. Yeah. But I actually think there's another interesting, more sort of direct, potentially genocidal reference here, um, because uh, Philana, who is who's uh, Harmon's wife, mm -hmm. um, her name actually did come up. We we were discussing yeah. beforehand, trying to remember her name because mostly <laughs> she's not that distinct a character. Sure, but um, Falana does give Kirk, Spock, and McCoy some information about the history of the Platonians. Alexander mm -hmm. gives them some information as well. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things Falana says is that they had instituted a eugenics program. 
So Correct. that only the like 38 best people survived or something like this, ultimately. And you can have eugenics without genocide. It's possible. Typically, though, genocides often involve eugenics. So let's start with well, that. I guess it depends question. on how you like, define the this... term, right? Like, like how are you yeah. defining what it means for um, someone or a civilization to use eugenics? Um, I mean, for example, I have type 1 diabetes. Um, I think it would be quite remarkable if our medical establishment could find a way to not only eradicate diabetes, but prevent it from happening, right? Could one describe that as eugenics? Well, perhaps, but I think you're absolutely right. When thinking about eugenics, we typically think about um, this kind of like mass eradication of a class of people who do not meet a yeah. certain set of um, physical maybe presentation or or like biological standards and expectations but i would also say like yeah phil the the casual way that she just references excuse me the casual way that she just references eugenics i mean that's how i would talk about like going out and getting a cup of coffee or something it's like oh and by the way we did some eugenics stuff right it's yeah. just so casual about it i mean i think that's one of the times where that's one of the first instances where we should be skeptical of these characters skeptical of this civilization the way they talk about eugenics as just this incredibly common thing um but what i what i also think is interesting especially thinking about this question of i'm, I'm just moving it maybe back toward this question of maybe yeah. a kind of genocide and thinking about them as colonizing figures like even if we just assume for a second that she that 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 they're not lying that this was an uninhabited place well They've been here for, what, thousands of years, right? Um, and they their, their pitch to McCoy, one of the reasons why he should stay is because you'll have minimal work and you'll spend most of your time reading, studying, conducting research, meditating, yet there's no indication that anyone has any meaningful information about anyone or any group of people who inhabited this place before they arrived, which that is something that I find incredibly dubious, right? What do you mean that it was, okay, maybe it was uninhabited when you arrived, but have you, in in all of your years of research and writing and studying, what have you learned and discovered? Because it sounds like all of this, all of this civilization that you've produced it's it's really just um like hagiography hey, about um like plato and the ancient greeks right it doesn't seem yeah. as if you've done anything to um adapt to or or integrate yourself into any civilizations that existed before you arrived and in that way they feel like capital c colonizers but i sure. also think it's it's interesting how um and I think this is something that you and I are maybe uniquely equipped to discuss how theory without practice or, or theory without praxis feels um, quite shallow and superficial. And so you have all of this theory about what a great civilization should look like, but in praxis um, or, or, or in practice, the way you exercise this, it's really just... Um, the torture, hu torture, humiliation, more than anything for everyone's entertainment. And I'm thinking now about a figure like Alexander and how he yeah. even even says he's a constant source of uh, derision in this society. And so I, yeah, I'm super dubious of these claims because it feels like they're just using all of this as a kind of rhetorical strategy to justify being just the absolute worst, whether that means they you know, committed a genocide, um, we we cannot say with any certainty, but yep. I'm at least skeptical of anyone who makes those kinds of claims, I guess. Yeah. So I, I think there's a couple of, of things I'd, I'd sort of add on to that. One, I think it is worth sort of noting that the Greeks were, the ancient Greeks were incredible colonizers. Mm -hmm. So that is kind of in line with 
their whole ancient Greek aesthetic, right? I mean, the Greeks colonized around the Black Sea. They colonized what's now Turkey. They colonized um, into the Levant, North Africa. They colonized Sicily and Italy as far away as Spain. Like they just sent people everywhere and were like, hey, this is our, this is our spot now. And often there were people living in those areas and there was conflict there. So it's not really unreasonable to say if the Platonians arrived on this planet and were like, this is our planet now, if there could very well have been indigenous inhabitants that they would have wiped out to establish that claim. No evidence from the episode that that happened, but it's not unreasonable to suppose, given what we know about the history of, of colonialism. Mm -hmm. The other thing that you were, were uh, talking about that I think is really interesting is this is a philosopher's society, right? Like yeah. their whole premise is, oh, we contemplate and we think through these big ideas. And, and you had talked about how it doesn't seem like they're integrated into any other civilizations. They don't have any real praxis. It's also not clear from the episode that they have any new philosophical ideas. I mean, yeah. they've spent 2,000 years just thinking and just philosophizing and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But there's no actual evidence that they've in any way progressed beyond Plato's thought. Mm -hmm. So it is this weird thing where it's like, cause, right? Because this is one of the, the big critiques a lot of people have of philosophy as a discipline is like, mm -hmm. it's just navel gazing, right? Mm -hmm. This idea that like, all right, you're just thinking about random pointless stuff and it doesn't actually matter. It's not even clear that they're thinking about random pointless stuff that doesn't matter. It's, <laughs> it seems like they're not thinking really about anything at all, except mm -hmm. let's go play a telekinetic game of chess where we force Alexander mm -hmm. to carry pieces around that are as tall as he is. It's yeah. worth pointing out that he, uh, he is a midget and he's the only Platonian who does not have telekinetic powers. So yeah. when they're playing the sort of chess pieces that are four feet tall, like Alexander is gripping these chess pieces and having yeah. to lift them up and they are as tall as him. Whereas the other Platonians are just like, yeah, I'm lifting that with my mind. Yeah. So and they could totally do that if that they wanted to. Anything. Yeah. And it's, yeah. it's, yeah. And they could like, there's Alexander's presence in that game is functionally unnecessary because of the telekinetic yep. powers they have. And again, that's one of the first indications. This is a really interesting episode when thinking about how narratives often, well, well-crafted narratives work retroactively where you as the viewer or the reader or whatever kind of medium you engage with, whatever that means yep. you are, um, the way you can then think back to those times when something as seemingly meaningless as a chess game, it really just gives the game at that point um, away, no pun intended, because yeah. they don't need Alexander there. In fact, you could argue Alexander's presence as a member of the slave class is utterly unnecessary, but it is, it seems, constitutive because of the necessity of establishing a kind of hierarchy, which seems so incredibly, um, again, necessary to the construction of the civilization. And Phil, you said something interesting that I wanted to mention, this word aesthetics, because I think this is a civilization that is platonic, but it's aesthetically platonic, which is to say yeah. it just has like the trappings and the signifiers of what it means for a society to be platonic or whatever. And what's really interesting, you've mentioned um, how uh, the, the Greeks were also colonizers. You know, when I think about the aesthetics today, like the aesthetics that people associate with in particular, like ancient Greek philosophy, I don't, I don't think people associate colonizing with that. Right. Which is not to yeah. say that, that like no one thinks that it's just when I think about, again, I'm imagining the um, 
like the cover of the Western canon, you know, that book by Harold Bloom, right? I yep. want to say like, there's like an image of this, this like, again, kind of like hagiographic hey image of the ancient Greeks, but at I no point- I think it's the like, isn't it? It may be, I don't, I mean, I, think I, I, just, I just remember- Or at least some, yeah. some editions. Yeah, 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 yeah. But that image under no circumstances um, betrays or suggests what you what you said before, which is um, this is a civilization that um, was deeply um, like their 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 existence necessitated colonizing, at least the way they existed. Yeah. Which is not to say that they needed to be that way, but that's just how they were. And I'm sure more people acknowledge and think about the necessity of a slave class, right? Um, but even that, you often yeah. hear people um, justify it in interesting ways. Um, so I think that's super interesting about the Plutonians, how they they are um, they they embody these ancient Greek ideals, but it's really just the aesthetics of what that means. Not not yeah um, yeah yeah. Anyway. And I wonder how much of that is I mean in, in the 60s, right? I think most people had I don't know. I want my temptation is to say most people had a more limited understanding mm -hmm. of the ancient Greeks than they do today, but I'm not really sure that people today have a great understanding of the ancient yeah. Greeks. Yeah. I mean, we've got You've got things like Hercules and Xena, and then mm -hmm. uh, Disney's Hercules and and mm -hmm. the Percy Jackson books and movies and mm -hmm. things like that, that I think have brought ancient Greek aesthetics more into people's consciousness. Mm -hmm. But this is something I think we see a lot with Star Trek, is we get these like 1960s understandings of, of things. Um, like I just, we had a video recently about the episode Spectre of the Gun, which um, is is sort of set in the Old West and takes mm -hmm. place at the, the gunfight okay. at the OK Corral. And it is this very like 1950s and 60s Western set. Like it's not, it's not by any stretch of the imagination historically accurate to what happened mm -hmm. at the gunfight at the OK Corral. But it it would be recognizable to people in the 60s raised on a diet of traditional westerns and then moving into the spaghetti westerns that, that mm -hmm. come to dominate the 60s so i think there is this sense of like this is what people in the late 60s would recognize as greek civilization mm -hmm. um and and yeah it is rooted in i think things like the sort of abstract concept of philosophy, uh, theater, democracy, uh, vase painting, but also mm -hmm. that architecture, right? The the different types of columns and things like that, white marble. And I think that the visual elements there are really important. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's sort of emptied out of all of that substance because what, so I think there's, there's difficulties. I, I always have difficulty, at least when we talk about Plato, because Plato attributes basically everything that he ever says to Socrates. It's sure. not clear how much Socrates in the Platonic dialogues is Socrates versus is Plato. Sure. But like Socrates his whole shtick is let's question everything that people think that they know. Mm -hmm. This civilization seems to have abandoned that idea. Um, and, and they don't seem to have set themselves any sort of challenges to actually overcome. Cause I think you're absolutely right. The, the circling back to the, the chess game there. You're absolutely right. Alexander's presence is entirely superfluous. It would Alexander's role there is to lose, to struggle and then lose that chess game. Mm -hmm. But if you wanted a real challenge in that chess game, 
you would have two of the Platonians play against one another, where each sure. of them was intending to win. It's like we have other chess just shows up throughout the original series of Star Trek. Right. Spock has had to to program the computer to play chess at his level <laughs> because nobody else is as good at chess as Spock is. So if he plays Kirk or McCoy or whoever else, they're just going to lose every time. And there's every no time. Yeah. Like what's, what's the point of doing that? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So it is this thing where it's like, all right, I'm going to play chess against my windows 95 program on the easiest <laughs> setting. And I'm going to win every time. Okay. I get a certain sense of enjoyment from that winning There's diminishing returns on that enjoyment. Mm -hmm but I'm not really improving my mind by beating a shit computer program on the easiest yeah. level. You know, hearing you because, I mean, Harmon, he feels Trumpy in a lot of ways, you know, like a lot of the language <laughs> about um, this civilization that the Plutonians have constructed. I mean, it feels deeply conservative in a lot of ways. Yeah. And I, think that's just hearing you talk about that and i'm not sure if i can articulate this as clearly as i want to but it feels that feels like a kind of conservative gesture where we don't sure. want we don't sure. want things to be challenging we don't want things to be difficult um we want things we want our society to operate in a way that is predictable based on a particular set of presuppositions that we determine. And the last thing we want to do is to afford maybe equal rights or opportunities to those among us who do not have our, um, let us say, lofty abilities, or, or maybe that's not the best way to describe it, um, those of us who like Alexander, who for reasons beyond um, his, his preferences, his will, etc., as we learn near the end of the episode, he consumes it's, it's, it's all the food on this, on this planet that allows them to have these yeah. telekinetic abilities, but he's just genetically, he is not genetically predisposed to have that ability yet. He's punished for it. It seems, yeah. um, and I guess just hearing you talk about it, I was thinking um, this this is an interesting way of constructing a society and a civilization without conflict or problem. Yet, I think what's so indicative of the way conservatives think is the way they construct enemies as a way of um, creating this kind of antagonism. So Alexander his presence is both a problem, but it's also a necessity at the same time, which is what I think is so yeah. fascinating about Alexander's presence. They do not need to treat him this way, but because this is a deeply conservative society, they absolutely need to treat him this way because without Alexander as that other whose presence antagonizes what would otherwise be a utopia, what do they have at that point? Um, yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah, that's, I think, really interesting. And what I was thinking as you were talking about that is um, Rene Girard has a book um, called Violence and... Hold on. I have it right here. Um, uh, where Where are okay. you, Girard? It's up here somewhere. Yeah, it's uh, like Violence and the Sacred, maybe? Violence and the Sacred. That's Is that right. the one? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and one of the things that he talks about, is actually constituent of Greek tragedy, uh, mm -hmm. is the importance of the, of the scapegoat in a tragic society. Mm -hmm. Alexander is that scapegoat, right? Because the thing, like, if... You're absolutely right. There's no real reason Alexander needs to be there. Uh, the Platonians have telekinetic abilities. They can do any of the stuff that they that they force him to do All of it, just yeah. by thinking it. There isn't any mm -hmm. reason to force him to do it, but 
having that sort of central figure around whom all of the violent impulses of society coalesces allows the rest of society to maintain that illusion of harmony. And that's mm -hmm. what Girard says about a figure like Oedipus in, uh, in Oedipus the King is like, mm -hmm. it's not inherently clear that the violence within this society is a result of Oedipus's actions, but everyone collectively decides that this figure who is in some way disposable is going to bear the burden of society's ills. And so society is able to function once it expels Oedipus and expels that violence. The Platonians have worked out a system where they don't have to expel the scapegoat. They can just keep the scapegoat in perpetuity. Mm -hmm. Because Alexander does say at one point, when they're when the Enterprise crew are trying to figure out what uh, what has given the Platonians their telekinetic abilities, um, they they determine that these powers are not combinable. Like mm -hmm. each individual has their own abilities, but they can't like work together. Yeah, and Alexander is like. Yeah, at some point, a few of them tried to work together to overthrow Parman, and it was a disaster. Mm -hmm. So, there, I mean, it is interesting. There is no, it's not clear that there is any other sort of lightning rod for all of that violence that otherwise would exist in this society other than Alexander, which in, in, potentially interesting ways raises questions about what happens to Platonian society when Alexander leaves with the Enterprise at the end of the episode. Not that yeah. I'm terribly bothered if they end up <laughs> ripping their civilization apart because of their petty squabbles, but yeah. that's, I mean, it, it, it's, it's the sort of weird paradox. Almost. And this is, um, this is Hegel's master slave dialectic in a way, right? Like, you can't have a ruling class without an underclass because the ruling class needs the acknowledgement of the underclass as the as the ruling class in order for it to be meaningful. Um, yeah. And I think we see that in Plato as well, um, right? Plato's Republic. This is a hierarchical society that Plato mm -hmm. imagines as an ideal civilization. But I, I want to I want to pull back a little bit to this mm -hmm. question because uh, we still in the U.S. today in Western Europe uh, places like this we have we have an underclass in society. Mm -hmm. Is it necessary to have an underclass, or could could there be a society in your opinion that didn't have an underclass? That's a big question. Well, I recognize. <laughs> so, yeah, I'll go ahead and fix that problem quickly. Um, no, I, I think pivoting from or borrowing from Hegel, right? I think we would acknowledge that the existence of, as you said, a kind of underclass, which is racialized in the United States, which I would argue yep. is not a coincidence, right? Our yep. underclass, um, they're often poor, but we in the United States have combined a poor underclass with a racial minority, right? Whether it's black and brown folk historically, even now thinking about um, the immigrant as, you know, a brown yeah. person from Mexico, right? Our our racialized underclass or, or our underclass, um, we racialize them in interesting ways. And I think when thinking about Hegel, Hegel's interested in thinking through the necessity of contradiction and so I would argue, do we need an underclass? No, but that's not to suggest that we can ever liberate ourselves from contradiction. I would like to think that maybe, maybe, and I think this is um, the genuine progressive project is to uh, find ways to channel that contradiction into uh, a form less exploitative, less predicated on a racialized, economically um, depressed and desolated 
uh, underclass, okay. right? Because I, I think the minute, like, I think a misreading of Marx is to think that, well, once we, once we have communism, we've eradicated contradiction. And I think that's, that doesn't make a lick of sense to me, right? Because that doesn't seem consistent with how human beings behave, whether it's within capitalism or not. I think contradiction is just constitutive, right? Just again, read Todd McGowan's work. He's an extremely influential thinker for me. So I think imagining a civilization without contradiction seems impossible, but I don't think it needs to be the way it is, right? I think we can do contradiction yeah. better, I guess, is is the way I would want to say it, if that makes sense. Okay. I don't know. You seem to disagree that maybe we could we could actually uh, manifest a kind of, of utopia. So. No, I, I'm not sure that we could. Um, okay. I would like to think that we could. The fact that the fact that there are no historical precedents for a society without an underclass is yeah. somewhat troubling in terms mm -hmm. of that that objective. Mm -hmm. Possibly, possibly, like early hunter gatherer civilizations may have not had an underclass. But that's a lot of speculation since we don't know a massive amount about how those societies were organized. Mm -hmm. No, I, I think I think finding a way to, to sort of navigate the contradictions within society, I think is a good way of approaching it. Mm -hmm. And I think we can have a I think we could have a civilization, we could have a society in which the gap between the underclass and the sort of ruling classes is minimized. Mm -hmm. I don't know that it can be eliminated, um, but I think we can have a more humane society or we can have a less humane society. Mm -hmm. And of the two, I would tend to lean toward a more humane society. Yeah, of course. And I guess Even it just if depends that's on less how you... profitable for CEOs. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. And I guess it depends on how you define those terms, like ruling yep. class and underclass, right? I mean, if you think about a ruling class in a distinctly capitalistic um, situation or scenario, we're talking about individuals who have an immense amount of power who can accumulate capital by exploiting workers. Um, yep. If, if, like, I say this to my students quite often, right? Like, yeah, I want a better society where. I don't know, all of you have not only the time, but the economic freedom to not produce like shitty tchotchkes that I might buy in a drugstore, but you just make art. Now, does that mean all of you will make great art? No, most of you will make shitty art. But if I have a choice between a world with a lot of shitty art or a world with a lot of shitty tchotchkes, I'll take the art. And I guess that's getting us closer to that. And and I, again, at that point, if you're thinking about the underclass is just maybe people who don't want to work a lot. Okay, that's fine. I would like to think we could create a society where if you just want to work a lot, which some people do, right? Like, like social yeah. science is quite clear about this, that there are some people who just really like to work, who like to do things, and that's fine. There are some people who don't, and that's fine as well. Let's just try to find a way where we're not um, punishing people for not wanting to work as hard as the people who uh, are, I don't know, in that like 99th percentile or whatever, right? And then yeah. if, if, if we're thinking about that as, as maybe definitional parameters for what it means for a group of people to be a ruling class and a group of people to be an underclass, that's fine because at that point we're not talking about the kinds of exploitation and the forms of exploitation that we see in the world today. But I like that, I would totally agree with you, absolutely. But yeah. I, I guess the point is like when thinking about um, the conservative rhetoric around like black and brown immigrants they don't acknowledge the contradiction there. I think that's part of the yeah. problem, right? It's not a contradiction for them. There's an enemy. And once we eradicate said enemy, we will then have the utopia that we know can exist. There's no acknowledgement yeah. of a contradiction there. There's no acknowledgement that, well, the black and brown immigrant today was the communist 30 years ago, right? Was, was, 
Um, I don't know a black freed former slave um, just occupying a space with a white woman, right? I mean, yeah. it's just there's there's no acknowledgement of that contradiction. So until we get to a point where we, again, in a kind of Hegelian sense, see the necessity of contradiction, I think the the freed black man who's occupying a space with a white woman, the the communist during the Red Scare, the black brown Mexican immigrant today, formally they're all the same. It's just the content that changes and the the failure to recognize the contradiction that keeps us in these sorts of loops, or at least keeps um conservative thought in those sorts of loops, I guess. So and and yeah. you're right. Like that's like they just it's it's fascinating how the uh Plutonians have just installed Alexander into that spot. It's always like it's just Alexander's all the way down for them, right? And yeah. and that's like that's a really convenient way of, as you said, constructing a kind of scapegoat, um, someone who perpetually functions as an obstacle, but at no point do they seem to acknowledge the necessity of that obstacle, which seems pretty necessary, I think, at least psychically, right? So yeah, yeah. So I, I want to. I'm glad that you pulled it back to to this episode because um, I want to. I want to take us, uh, in a related direction um, with with this question of um, the underclass, the question of uh, you know violence and and things like this, but also interestingly enough, the question of aesthetics again, because you, like you had said, you would rather we had a bunch of shitty art than a bunch of shitty tchotchkes. We yeah, had talked yeah. about ancient Greek aesthetics before. Um, I can't remember if you mentioned during this video or in our pre-reporting conversation, but so much of the torture of Alexander, of Kirk, and of Spock, and then later of Uhura and Nurse Chapel when they're brought down, it is it is a bizarrely aesthetic torture, right? Like Alexander is forced to play the lute and sing ballads. Um, Kirk and Spock are forced to act out Tweedledum and Tweedledee, which interestingly yeah. enough does not come from ancient Greek civilization. Um, and then in the sort of big climactic torture scene at the end where, where uh, Spock serenades Uhura and, and Chapel, and then their Kirk and Spock are like going back and forth between them before uh, Spock kisses Chapel and Kirk kisses Uhura. We'll talk about that also, uh, by the way, because yeah, that's yeah, kind I've, of an important I've, moment. Yeah, um, I have some thoughts about that too, yeah. Yeah, yeah but this is it's not properly set up like Greek drama, but it, it's kind of set up like Greek drama. Like the Platonians are there watching all of this and the mm -hmm. two, what are the, what are the old Muppet guys who just. Oh, the critics everything? in the, yeah. Yeah. Like you've yeah, got yeah, the, yeah. these two Platonians who are just playing that role where they're just like insulting <laughs> this that performance. Too. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So like it is an it is an aesthetic approach to torture. Um and I want us to talk about the role of torture here. And like you you had brought up before our discussion um Hilary Neroni's book. So oh, yeah. like I mean that I have you, it can, here. you can sort of reintroduce that to to the world yeah, totally. of YouTube if um, you want to. Yeah. Sure. So I mean I would recommend to anyone um this wonderful book called The Subject of Torture by Hilary Neroni. She makes a lot of interesting observations in this book, but it's primarily about the uh, Bush administration post 9-11 and their justification for what they called enhanced interrogation techniques, which, again, if you ever doubted that torture was just about the accumulation of truth and, and, and intelligence, just, I mean, think about the aesthetics of a term like enhanced interrogation techniques instead of torture, which like torture is so clear and direct and utilitarian, but it's, they had to, they had to fancify it in some way. Um, 
But she starts the book by asking, excuse me, she starts the book by asking an interesting question, which is, so everything we heard from the Bush administration and the intelligence community post 9-11 about torture and enhanced interrogation techniques is, um, this is not even a necessary evil. It's not even evil because what we are doing is in the pursuit of intelligence and information to not only avenge the United States, avenge the good people of New York, but to also prevent future terrorist attacks, right? This is in everyone's best interest. So all of that, I mean, if you just buy that, all of that sounds reasonable to some degree, right? We all make certain concessions to live in a society and to live in a civilization, uh, despite what libertarians in the United States want us to think, we cannot live in some lawless anarchy, because what would that look like? So we all understand, uh, as Rousseau might suggest, to enter into civilization, we also accept a kind of social contract. I say all of that because that feels like what the Bush administration wanted us to accept. This is just part of the social contract. And the social contract, it's always changing and evolving. And in a world where um, villainous people from the Middle East want to kill you, part of that social contract is accepting the necessity of these enhanced interrogation techniques. Okay. Yep. Well, Neroni asks an interesting question, which is, okay, why then in those Abu Ghraib photos, were so many people smiling <laughs> like they're because they were these awful photos that showed the depravity of torture enhanced interrogation techniques whatever but the thing that she really focuses on is all of the smiling which is to say the sense of enjoyment so yep. that i think that recognition um not only should cause us to uh, fundamentally rethink um, the the justifications around torture, but it should allow us to at least acknowledge that these kinds of efforts, torture, it's not just about either coercing someone into doing something, which is what the uh, Plutonians want from Dr. McCoy, but there's yeah. also an element of enjoyment that language like enhanced interrogation techniques actively suppresses. And I think you see this multiple times throughout the episode earlier in subtle ways, like all of these cuts to uh, Parman's wife, where as, as he's torturing Kirk and Spock, we see her smiling and smirking. Why is she doing that? Why does she enjoy this? And I think you're right. There's a kind of excess or a kind of maximalism to this later when it becomes really a kind of theatrical performance where torture becomes not just um, a utilitarian approach to uh, accumulating knowledge and intelligence in an effort to save a country, but there becomes, as you said, a kind of theatricality, a kind of aesthetics of torture. And again, the thing that I would just want to, to emphasize, which is what Neroni emphasizes, is we cannot, well, first, the idea that you could ever, like, really know I mean, that's a fallacy unto itself, but the idea that it is just about accumulating knowledge and not about enjoyment is a premise we should reject. And I think this episode yep. beautifully articulates the constitutive necessity of enjoyment to things like torture, because otherwise there would be no smile. They have an objective. Yep. They want to accomplish that objective. Torture is the best way to do it. Okay, again, explain the enjoyment. And and I don't think anyone can because it's really about the enjoyment. It's not like McCoy is irrelevant in that way. He's more than anything just an opportunity to, as you said earlier, channel these um, drives and desires. And I think, again, this episode's really good at articulating that. Yeah. I think that's great. Um Obviously not the torture or the enjoyment of torture, but I think the analysis is great. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, I, I think that that goes a long way toward explaining, again, why the the torture and the humiliation of these characters does take these aesthetic forms. I mean, if, if the goal was 
I will torture Captain Kirk with my mind until Dr. McCoy agrees to stay. I can just shatter his bones inside his body or something like that. I don't need to force him to pretend to be a horse and have Alexander ride on his back or something like this. Mm -hmm. That's not, that's not like the most efficient way of achieving that objective. But it's entertaining. Mm -hmm. And so that that idea, I think, makes a lot of sense. That it isn't about achieving a particular goal. The torture is an end in itself. But because it is, in some way, a disreputable end, it's presented as a means to a different end. Mm -hmm. I think that's absolutely right. Um, and there's so a lot I, I of wanna... interesting, well, sorry, sorry for interrupting you. No, it's just ahead. like, I would also say, unlike these extra judicial areas that the United States government created yep. uh, to uh, do this, this torture, these enhanced interrogation techniques, I think it's fascinating how, I mean, you could even argue the Plutonians at least are more honest about it than we were because they just did it all like out, <laughs> like there's, there's, there's yep. no like, Let's let's send Kirk down to the dungeons with McCoy and then slowly torture him um, in a way that no one within this civilization can know, see, or understand. It's it's surprisingly public, which yeah. I think I mean, like, I'm not necessarily sure I have any clear thoughts about that, aside from they've they've seemingly dispensed with the idea that this is disreputable, but yeah. they still need the framing device, which I think is important because so, so even though um, they, even though the Plutonians don't see it as potentially disreputable in the way that the Bush administration did, they still yeah. see the necessity of having a kind of mediation that we can't just say. So, Let's brutalize these people now because that's fun. They need to, again, create this weird justification. Like we actually want Dr. McCoy to stay, but we want him to stay of his own volition and to accomplish that. And we will torture and humiliate his closest friends. <laughs> Logically, this makes no sense. But I think like the psychoanalytic point is enjoyment is logical. That's that's why it's enjoyment it, it's it doesn't have the kind of logic that we often associate in the same way that um all of our behavior to some degree is wildly illogical at times we enjoy in yeah. illogical ways and i think again this episode even though it looks a little different from how torture um occurred after 9 11 it still understands the necessity of the frame it still understands the necessity of mediation it still understands the necessity of of, of misdirection indirection all of that stuff which is super interesting absolutely so uh we are getting a little bit long i want to keep this video reasonably uh short but there's a couple of sure. other important points i think are really worth talking about with this episode one uh, one more is directly related to these torture scenes. Um, and that is when Kirk kisses Uhura during this weird performance theater thing, right? Be and this is a really famous moment. Um, you may or may not know this, but this is, there's some debate about this, but this is widely regarded as the first interracial kiss on network television. And it was a huge deal at the time. Uh, there are people who actually argue that there were, were interracial kisses on, on TV before this, but there's disagreement about exactly what parameters should be used. Um, and that's that's the question that I had as well, because, like, I love Lucy. Like, Desi Arnaz, yeah. he wasn't white, you know, but it's funny how, um, like, how many times did they kiss on, I mean, I'm not asking you as if you know the answer. It's more yeah, rhetorical, but, like, the point is, like, they kissed a lot, right? I mean, so so that was an interracial marriage on network television in the 50s. But it's fascinating yeah. how um, people don't seem to consider that an interracial kiss. That's just, that's. I just wanted to add yeah. that. I, I find that fascinating that that's not uh, an example of an interracial kiss, but but this, this is so. Yeah. 
but I, so I, I think none the I think nonetheless, whether this is nonetheless or is yeah. not the first interracial kiss on network television, sure. I, I'm not that interested in debating it. It symbolically no, nor, nor, nor stands yeah. as that. Like people took it sure. to be that, whether that's fair or not. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And and it is worth remembering. This is 196. I think we're still in late 68 when this comes out. It's like out. 68, 69, right? Yeah. 68, early 69, maybe. Um, so, I mean, civil rights movement is in full swing at this point. And mm -hmm. of course, Uhura as a character was incredibly important for the civil rights movement just across the board. Okay. Um, there, I, I may have said this in a different video, but like, there's a great story where like, in in season toward the end of season one, Nichelle Nichols was was going to leave Star Trek because she didn't really feel like it was going anywhere. Okay. But then she was at a I forget which organization it was. I want I want to say um, NAACP, but I could be wrong about that. But she was at at an at a civil rights event, um, a dinner with Martin Luther King Jr., and he told her that the kings only let their children stay up to watch star trek because she was on that show okay and that was that was why she she stayed on for the for all three seasons cool. um was that that moment and um whoopi goldberg who was in uh next generation mm. she's told the story that like when she first saw Star Trek and saw Uhura as a member of the command crew, like she just, as a kid, just went like tearing through her house, screaming, mama, mama, there's a black woman on TV and she ain't no maid. So, nice. I mean, Uhura yeah. was this incredibly important yeah. figure for, for starting this trend of, yeah. of positive representation of African-American mm -hmm. women on TV. And this interracial kiss, again, whether or not it was the, the first one or not, I think plays an important sort of milestone in a mm -hmm. similar way. And so given that this is the height of the civil rights movement, we can pull this back to this sort of question of, of an underclass in the U.S. and, and the constituent nature of that. Um, and I, I don't know, I guess I don't have a concrete question there, but like, what are... what? What do you think well, about this in terms of like, is this, is this genuinely sort of a moment where we can say, all right, we have a white man and an African-American woman kissing on TV, or is this sort of weirdly not liberatory moment because this is part of the torture? Yeah. I mean, I think there's a couple of things I mentioned. Um, I love Lucy before I might be wrong yeah. about this, but for, I think, most, if not all, of that show's original run, it was in black and white. And, yep. and I think that's, like, thinking about Desi Arnaz, I mean, I'm sure there are race scholars who could talk about this in more intelligent ways, but he, even though he carries a lot of, of like, non-white signifiers, he also carries a lot of, like, white signifiers, the idea that he's yep. always in a suit and tie, that I think he's he's framed as even though I think what he's a singer, it's it's still like he's a kind of industrious businessman, right? Like that's yeah. how the show, if I recall correctly, wants to treat him. And again, even the idea that for most of the show, it was in black and white. And because of his complexion, he looks more white than anything else. That's not the case here. I mean, Aurora yeah. is like like unmistakably black, right? Yeah. And I guess part of what's what's interesting is you're you're right, this interracial kiss happens, but it is, I would like to think or hope, a reluctant one because it's not Kirk wanting to do this or even Aurora um, agreeing to this. There's there's no consent happening here. They yeah. are they are exploited sexually for the enjoyment of let us be frank, this slave master, right? And so I yeah. think that is. I don't necessarily know if that framing necessarily. Um, should cause us to reject it. I think maybe it should cause us to reflect and to think about how um, this question of, well, what does it mean for Black people to have a presence in popular media 
And what is their role? How are they treated? Because I think, again, this is an yeah. interesting episode where she, we have this interracial kiss, but it's one that's forced upon her and forced upon Kirk. It's, it's not a consensual kiss. Um, and so just again, thinking about how so much um, black representation, it does feel like it's, in addition to that representation occurring, there are these sorts of concessions that seem necessary. Like, could it? Yeah. And, and you, 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 you know Star Trek better than I do. Like, the idea that Kirk and Aurora, I don't, I don't know if this is true or not. The idea that they could maybe have a vibrant relationship together without these coercive, without this coercive framing, that seems impossible. Like, I don't know. Like, you can tell me. Like, is there any? Um, since this is near the end of season three, that would lead me to think no, um, that there's no suggestion that the two of them or or like any, um, because I mean, there are multiple white people on this show, right? The idea that she could have a yeah. relationship with any of them. I have the distinct impression that's something the show never addressed. Is that correct? Am I making a correct assumption? Not really. Not, yeah. not really. Okay. Okay. Oh, um, you mean, I'm, you mean the show correct. doesn't yes. really... Gotcha. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. Yeah. Cool. I mean, there's some bits, um, Mirror Mirror, for instance, where they go into an alternate universe. Sulu is is clearly interested in Uhura. Okay. But, I mean... But that's an alternate universe, right? It's you an know, alternate so, universe. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no... Re like, she... Kirk has an interest in some female crew members, but they tend with with the exception of Janice Rand, who leaves after like episode eight, they tend to be like one-off things, the way that all of Kirk's relationships yeah. are. Uhura never really gets a romantic storyline with anybody okay. else, which I kind of actually feel is a good thing, generally, given the given the problematic history of representations of African-American women and sexual exploitation and things. Um, in one of the movies, she does do a fan dance to distract some random enemy soldiers or things like that. Hey, so there's that, you know. Yeah. By the movie, she clearly has some sort of sexual identity, but in the show, yeah. it's not particularly developed. Explored. So, yeah. Yeah, she's yeah, a I professional mean, I first and foremost. Hey, yeah, and that, I mean, you could probably, <laughs> I, I'm sure there's a lot of interesting feminist scholarship about how, you know, Kirk yeah. can be like the horniest guy in the galaxy and still professional where um, Aurora, as you said, um, probably needs to work twice as hard and still doesn't get what the Kirks of the world get. I mean, but again, like, yeah. I would just want to reiterate and emphasize the the coercive nature of this i think is important the idea that yeah. um this sexualizing of a black woman it it happens under coercive terms and i think whether intentional or not because who cares like yeah. what an interesting statement on well what it means to be a black woman in the world or a black woman in media and how how one's sexuality is um, presented, dramatized, explored. It's, it, it feels like the point the episode wants to make. And again, whether that's a point that, that the creators intended or not, but I think it's a point that um, a viewer or a reader can make is, well, all of these explorations of black sexuality happen under coercive, under a coercive framework, I guess, which, I mean, I think that's yeah. maybe just, the point I would want to make, or at least where I would want to to maybe not stop that conversation, but at least start it and get some feedback from others who could probably talk about it better than I could. So, All right. So uh, one last question I do want us to touch on, the one that I, I had introduced toward the beginning of our discussion. Um, is this a society that Plato would be proud of? What do you think? Well, I, I mean, you, well, I think this is, this is probably more your area than mine. Um, I think I, I 
instinctively want to say no. Um, I don't know. Like, I, I, I would more love to hear you talk about this because I think again, this is more, this is more your area than mine. But I mean, maybe instinctively, I would want to say no. But I could be totally wrong about that. You know, I, I tend to agree, actually. Um, but, but so first off, I'll, I'll say I, I'm not a huge fan of Plato. Uh, oh, I think, okay. I think, it, especially because I'm sort of most familiar with his political philosophy, and I don't tend to agree with his political philosophy. Um, so, so I'm thinking about this particularly in terms of a, a book like The Republic, mm -hmm. um, because Plato does spend a tremendous amount of time in The Republic saying, "Look." everybody is suited for a particular thing. They should do that particular thing. And we find out that this society is sort of oriented around that idea, right? Mm -hmm. um, Alexander says after, um, after he explains that they were, n none of the Platonians have ever been able to combine their powers. Um, he says that Harmon believes that each of them is suited to a different task that's a very platonian yeah. idea from the republic mm -hmm. um and and plato believes in the establishment the existence of an underclass he's not mm -hmm. he's i think a lot of us today because plato has this sort of I, this this um image as a sort of father of western philosophy or stepfather maybe if socrates is the father plato is the stepfather the scribe or something of of western I mean, philosophy socrates socrates um, is socrates is the daddy and uh and, yeah. and, and and like plato is just like the stepdad you know who, who yeah you know wants wants the kids to like him i guess so yeah yeah, yeah. but like i i think we want to believe that plato is this sort of big believer in like freedom and liberty and equality and things like this. And in the sense that like he wanted Socrates to be free to ask questions of the Athenians without being punished by being forced to drink hemlock. Sure. sure. But in the Republic, Plato is like, yeah, most people are dumb and they suck and they should just you know, accept that they're an underclass of slaves or workers and they should serve the philosopher kings and the, mm -hmm. the ruling elite and whatnot. And it was interesting because I, I was struck when I was re-watching this episode that Harmon tells Kirk, ours is the most perfect kind of democracy mm. where anyone can be anything he wants, interestingly enough, gendered term there. Um, mm -hmm. and, and actually that's one of the things that I'll give Plato credit for. He said it should, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Gender is not a determining factor. It should be what one's natural ability is for, but he believed that it would be philosopher Kings and men were mm -hmm. most adapted to rule. Um, mm -hmm. but Plato hated democracy in the Republic. He's like, democracy is basically like a prostitute who just accepts money from whoever and does mm -hmm. whatever. And that is bad. Correct, correct no, me if I'm wrong. Like, he hated poets as well, right? Yeah. He, he, yeah. he hated the arts. He believed that, um, if the arts were going to be allowed in the ideal city at all, they should be allowed purely. It should be purely educational just mm -hmm. to teach people traditional values and ways of doing things. Mm -hmm. Tragedy would be abolished. Comedy would be abolished. Um, mm -hmm. Any, any elements of epic poetry that in any way criticized the gods or traditional society mm -hmm. would be cut mm -hmm. out of those epics. And only the things that are like, yes, the gods are awesome. Society is right. Do what you're told and remain in line. Only those things would be allowed to stay. Would love book burnings. So he would love book burnings. Probably. Yeah. 
which is really kind of ironic because Socrates was all about let's question things. And then yeah. Plato turns around and is like, the purpose of art is to just teach us the stuff we already know is right. <laughs> um, so in a way, like, it, in the sense that, like, we all, I think, like the idea that Plato was in this liberatory tradition. Mm -hmm. No, this is not a, a, a society he would approve of. But in the sense that something like the Republic says society should be organized hierarchically. Some people are intended to suffer within that hierarchy. And you should be very, like, the education system should be designed to teach us our place in society. Maybe this is a society he would actually approve of. Yeah, but maybe not for the reasons we might we might want. Yeah, I think you might be right about that. And again, it's interesting because um, this this society um, that they've created, the Plutonians, it is hierarchical, but that hierarchy, like most, if not all, hierarchies, feels constructed and arbitrary because yeah. when you hear um plato say things like well i loathe democracy because most people lack intelligence well how are you defining the word intelligence because i know a lot of people who uh, to be quite frank are not that great at analyzing a poem but they are some of the most empathetic people i've ever met in my life um but I have the distinct impression that doesn't count as intelligence, right? Um, so I would want to ask, well, and again, in the same way that I would ask this of the Plutonians, how are you defining intelligence? Um, because someone like Alexander seems to have a far better understanding of what fairness is than anyone else in this society, yet that does not count as a kind of intelligence because they have defined it. Yeah, and, and my God, ethics, right? Because they've defined those terms in the narrowest ways possible. Um, but I would also say, like, depending on how you want to define these terms, right? If you imagine that an underclass is simply a group of people who would prefer not to work as much as everyone else, yeah, sure, but that doesn't then mean they must be uh, slaves, workers, living these miserable lives so that philosophers can uh, sit and philosophize and meditate. Because again, back to what I said earlier, um, show me the tangible um, results of all of this philosophizing. Because again, what I see in this episode, what I see with the Plutonians is a uh, theory without praxis. And theory without praxis, as you said, is just navel gazing. And yep. that seems incredibly useless to me now it seems incredibly useful to those individuals who have the opportunity to gaze at said navel but if if you're anyone or everyone else that feels like a deeply miserable existence and that not only doesn't feel egalitarian but it also doesn't feel utopian so i would uh maybe you're maybe you're right like yes this feels platonic but we should still reject it nonetheless so Right. I think that's a good place to leave it. Okay. So. Hey, we, we didn't talk. I, I know this is not my, uh, this is not my YouTube channel. Uh, Kirk delivers some of Sonnet 57. Hmm. That's pretty cool. That's all I got. I just wanted to yeah. say that. So yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, Shakespeare is another one that just runs Pops throughout up Star yeah. Trek. It's chess yeah. and Shakespeare. Yeah. Being your slave, what should I do but tend upon the hours and times of your desire? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Beautiful. I mean, horrifying, but beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Also, interestingly enough, not written at the time the Platonians would have left Earth. <laughs> That's true. Well, yeah. So, I mean, is, is, is the implication that they forced him to say that? Mm. It, it's unclear whether they forced him to say that or whether they were just like, hey, Kirk, recite some poetry that you know. Yeah, Kirk about being a slave. Shakespeare about being, Kirk would yeah. know through the looking glass. Yeah, yeah. Recite, but, a, recite a poem about being a good slave. Yeah, go. Yeah. yeah, no, that makes that actually makes a kind of sense. Yeah, 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 yeah. But 
<laughs> I suspect the writers of the episode just didn't think through the implications that much, though, if I'm honest. And that's and that's okay, uh, because all good writing has plot holes, so that's not a yep. problem. Cool. All right. Well, thank you, Colin, for being here. This was, as always, a great discussion. Um, and actually, I think we're going to... This was our second uh, interview. We've got our third one coming up. Requiem for okay. Methuselah. So oh, I'm looking forward. YouTube yeah, fans. no, please. I would. Um, and, I, and I remembered before, um, the first time you and I spoke on this channel, we spoke about Hamlet. So this is actually the third yeah. time we've spoken. Yeah, so that'll be, this is, I mean, I'm practically becoming a co-host of the, of the Theater of Phil. Is it Theater of Phil YouTube channel? Is that yeah. right? Okay, yeah. yeah. Putting it on my CD. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, again, thank you for being here. Uh, great. Thank discussion, you so much. As always. Yeah, I loved it. Thank you, Phil.